joy to the world on a night like no other Emmanuel. The shepherds came to see the baby stood by his mother's side. Here in the Savior, inside a manger, oh, what a glorious night. Oh, 
what a glorious night. I hear the angels singing, hallelujah, let the earth receive her King. I know that love has come, sing it out, Jesus Christ is born. Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds wondered, they couldn't hide it, told everyone inside. All who were amazed when they heard how God came down on the glorious down on the glorious night. I hear the angels singing, hallelujah, let the earth receive her king. I know that love has come, sing it out, Jesus Christ is born. I hear the angels Jesus Christ is born. Jesus Christ is born. Well, a great big good morning and Merry Christmas to those of you who have joined us in person this morning, to those who are watching on live stream. We say the same thing. Good morning. Merry Christmas to you. We look forward to having you here in our service live and in person. But we love you, and we believe that today God is going to meet us in a powerful, powerful way. And we just ask you open up your hearts and receive all that God has yes. for you. Here we go. I hear the angels singing, hallelujah, let the earth receive her king. I know that love has come, sing it out. Jesus Christ is born. Jesus Christ is born. Glorious, glorious, what a glorious night. 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 I hear the angels singing, hallelujah, let the earth receive her king. I know that love has come, sing it out. Jesus Christ is Lord born. I hear the angels singing, hallelujah, let the earth receive her king. I know that love has come, sing it out. Jesus Christ is born. Jesus Christ is born. Yes, he is. How thankful we are. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to this earth. Yes. Thank you for rescuing us, Thank reaching into our to lives. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You guys sounded great this morning. Well, you can turn in your hymnal or you can look up on the screen either way. And we're going to sing the birthday of a king. Amen. The birthday of a king. Hymn number 136 if you want to use your hymnal.
Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love and wonders of His love. Hey, kids, if you go to the back, well, there's a lot of them back there, you can get your bells and anyone else who is young in, in spirit as well. Now, I know at Bethel Church, you wait in 
breathed in bated anticipation for Pastor Tom's solo on the bells. Now, you don't have to be here just today. I'm going on a world tour starting on tomorrow, starting in uh, Auckland, New Zealand, and then Japan and Europe. And so you can come on the world tour with me because, I mean, it's worth, it's worth the price of admission to see my rock out solo on the bells here today. So kids, get your bells. Those who are young in spirit, get your bells and be prepared to be awed. One, two, oh, one, two, three. Come on, ring those bells like the Christmas tree. Jesus is the King, born for you and me. Come on, ring those bells, everybody say. Jesus, we remember this short birthday. Come on, ring those bells like the Christmas tree. Jesus is the King, born for you and me. Come on, ring those bells, everybody say. All right, here's my solo. Here's my solo. Come on, ring those bells, light the Christmas tree. Jesus is the King, born for you and me. Come on, ring those bells, everybody say. Jesus, we remember this your birthday. Come on, ring those bells, light the Christmas tree. Jesus is the King, born for you and me. Come on, ring those bells, everybody say. Jesus, we remember the short birthday. Jesus, we remember the short birthday. Jesus, we remember the short birthday. Mic drop. <laughs> Turn around and greet your neighbor. Air high five, air hug, air handshake, and tell them you're glad to see them at Bethel Church this morning. And you look really good this morning, too. You sound really good as well. Amen. God bless you. Tell people you love them. If you won't, I will. We love you. We love you. We love you. Yes, we do. We love you. We love you. And we're in for a real treat this morning. Let's see, Mrs. Filio. Where is Mrs. Filio? Where is Mrs. <laughs> I love the sound of the kids. Oh my gosh. Mrs. Filio, do we need all? Should we turn out these uh, side lights as well? Those can stay on. Uh, but the, how about the side lights? If we could have one of the ushers take out the side lights here, the north and the south side lights. But Brother John, if you could kick out those, please. That'll help us. Because this is way cool. Oh, and the light's in the back, too, on that west wall. Uh, so we'll take those all out. Just flip them off. Yep, on the south side, there's a couple on. And then on the west, well, let's see, let's take out those south ones, too. Slip those out. There we are. Will that be good, Mrs. Filio? All right. Awesome. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. Mary was engaged to marry Joseph, but before they married, she learned that she was going to have a baby. She was pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. God sent the angel Gabriel to Mary, a virgin who lived in Nazareth, a town in Galilee. The angel came to her and said, Greeting the Lord, um, has blessed you and is with you. Mary was very confused what the angel had said. Um, what does this mean? 
Don't be afraid, Mary, because God is pleased with you. Listen, you will become pregnant. You will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and people will call him the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of King David, his ancestor. He will rule over the people of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary said to the angel, How can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel said to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will cover you. The baby will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. God can do everything. Mary said, I am the servant girl of the Lord. Let this happen as you say, then the angel went away. Mary's soon-to-be husband, Joseph, was a good man. He did not want to disgrace her in public, so he planned to divorce her secretly. Well, Joseph thought about this. An angel of the Lord came to him in a dream. The angel said, Joseph, descendant of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. The baby in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. You will name the son Jesus. Give him that name because he will save his people from their sins. When Joseph woke up, he did what the Lord's angel had told him to do. Joseph married Mary, but he did not have intimate relationship with her until she gave birth to the son. All this happened to make clear the full meaning of what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be pregnant. She will have a son, and they will name him Emmanuel. This means God is with us. At that time, Augustus Caesar sent an order to all people in the city that were under Roman rule that they must list their names in a register and everyone went to their own towns to be registered. So Joseph left Nazareth, a town in Galilee. He went to the town of Bethlehem in Judea. This town was known as the town of David. Joseph went there because he was from the family of David. Joseph re registered with Mary because she was engaged to marry him. Mary was now pregnant. While Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem, the time came for her to have the baby, and she wrapped she him birth. in, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, because there was no room for them in the inn. So she wrapped the baby in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. The sun. The sun. <laughs> the
That night, some shepherds were in the fields nearby watching their sheep. An angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord was shining around them, and suddenly they became very frightened. The angel said to them, Don't be afraid, because I am bringing you some good news. It will be a joy to all the people. Today your Savior was born in David's town. He is Christ the Lord. This is how you will know him. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Then a very large group of angels from heaven joined the first angel. All the angels were praising God, saying, Give glory to God in heaven, and on earth let there be peace to the people who please God. Then the angels left the shepherds and went back to heaven. The shepherds said to each other, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. We will see this thing the Lord told us about. The shepherds went quickly and found Mary and Joseph, and the shepherds saw the baby lying in a manger. Then they told what the angels had said about this child. What a fantastic job the, the children did. And thank you to the teachers, you know, um, and, and in particular, yes, put your hands together. And Mrs. Filio did that. That woman has more talent in her pinky fingernail than we have in buckets. <laughs> yeah, she is amazing. But, you know, also, too, I want to say with these teachers, you know, uh, parents, have, have your children under the tutelage and the teaching of these teachers because, you know, we've known each of them for 20 30, 40 years, and they've been working in children ministry literally for 20 and 30 and 40 years, and their lives can be replicated. Their lives could be patterned after, and so I want to say to each of you parents, put your children under their mentorship, under their teaching, and uh, you know, the Bible says it's enough for the student to become like the teacher, and if these students will become like those teachers, they'll do real well. They'll do real well. Well, let's go to the Word of God here this morning. We're going to read once again a portion of the, of the Christmas story <clears throat> given to us, and we just encourage you to lift your voice nice and loud like we love God's Word and to uh, read this together with us. So let's go to the reading of God's Word uh, for this morning from Luke chapter 2, and uh, I'll just give you a little heads up. The word is Quirinius. <laughs> You're going to come on to the second slide, and there's going to be the word Quirinius, so that's how you pronounce that. Okay. So let's read together. In, In those, those days, days Caesar, Caesar Augustus, Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that in your great wisdom and even greater wisdom was your great love, that it was in your heart from eternity's beginning, Lord, that 
you would, you would send your son to this earth to be the savior for our sins, that we didn't have to pay for our sins. We didn't have to find a way to get to heaven and to get to God. You would be the way. You would be the way. And you sent your son <laughs> screaming and kicking and yelling into a, a manger, a barn, Lord, a humble setting, Lord. But it was there in that place that the king of kings and the Lord of lords was pronounced to mankind and how thankful we are for your coming to this earth. And we celebrate you in this season, Lord, as, as probably no other time before, but we celebrate you in this season of your great love for us. And we know that we know that we know that we're loved by God, yes, that we're yes. loved by God, that we are not orphans, we are not alone, we are not here to try and figure things out. We have been loved by God with an everlasting love, and you've drawn us with loving kindness. How thankful we are for that. And Lord, you've called us then to love you in return, to love you with our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. So we rise up toward that, Lord God, to be that kind of a person to you, to love you with all that is within us. And I pray today, Holy Spirit, for each person that's here, for those who are watching by live stream, that the needs and the cares and the troubles of life would be met in you today. Lord, each one of us has so many things in our lives that we can't figure out, we can't solve, we can't fix, but you can, and you are able. And so we look to you, Jesus, and we say, help us. Help us, oh God. Intervene into our world. Come to our world. Come near to us, Lord God, and fix us, change us. Help us, oh God. We desperately need you, and we cry out to you because you said that when we cry out to you, you hear us, oh God. And we thank you that you do, that you are as near as our faintest prayer, Lord God, and we thank you for that. We pray, Jesus, for healing for bodies that are sick, that are diseased, that are suffering, that are in pain, to those that are in need of healing, that, Jesus, you would bring healing to them. Lord, to those that are in distress, Lord, over whatever it might be, we pray that the Prince of Peace will especially draw near to people. Lord, we've asked for divine wisdom. We just face things, and we don't know what to do. We don't know how to do it, Lord, but you do, and so we ask you for the wisdom that comes from you, that you'll deposit that wisdom within us. Lord, we ask for a baptism of joy, Lord, that we would just be full of joy and a baptism of love, Lord God, that we would love you and we would love others as we ought to, Lord God, that we would have a, a heart for humanity, Lord, not just our friends, not just fellow Christians, but for anyone that we encounter, because Jesus, wherever you went, you loved people. And we pray that you'll anoint us with that same love for humanity, Jesus, to reach into their lives. And we pray that all that is said and done today Everything that's said and done will be to your honor, praise, yes. and glory, we pray yes. in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yes. yes. Well, I, I just have to say, you look amazing. <laughs> I love... Well, I, I just want to say, now, to those of you who want to buy this tie, I'm sorry, that's not... I, that's You have to go to the dollar store to get that, you know, so... I told him I liked how it was short. Either he was too tall or that tie was too short. It looked so funny. Uh, today there's enough glitter, there's enough sparkle for me. I'm happy. I love glitter. When I saw those kids get up with the bows on them and you guys with the lights, I'm looking out there and people even have lights on their heads. I just love it. It's so fun. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for coming out today and, and for celebrating with us in kind of a silly way but for celebrating with us the coming of our Savior. This is what has changed my life when Jesus came to my life. It wasn't just enough to know about him and, oh, even to hang around people who had him. That was another phase of my life was I thought it was good enough just being around the other people who had him. But when he was born in me, I, I will never be the same again, and I just love celebrating. This time of year is like the external view of what happened inside of me. Lights exploded and glitter and, yeah, the whole thing. Lots of love, lots of joy like Pastor Tom was praying for. And I want to say, and a peace. God brings a peace. Remember how the angels said that. Receive the peace of God. When Jesus says, I give that to you, we have to receive it. It's kind of like a present. We don't just put it under the tree. 
Yesterday, a little girl tried to open Pastor Tom's Christmas present at my house. It was the cutest thing, and I had to talk her down. I said, no, no, that's for PT. Don't open it. Don't. And her fingers just went under the paper, and she just kept fingering it. It wasn't even something she'd want, but she saw that present, and she wanted to receive it. She wanted to open it. And I want to encourage you today, open up the gift receive the gift of a savior no longer do we have to be good Whew. i wasn't very good at that anyways no longer do we have to try and try and try and try no longer do we have to suffer we don't have to suffer we can just open up and receive the gift a savior who can save us not only from our sins but he can save us from ourselves isn't that sometimes the most destructive part of all? Oh, thank you, Savior, for coming. Well, we're going to celebrate that Thursday evening, and you and your family and anyone you meet in the store, anyone you drive up the street and you see them, throw open the car door and tell them, hop in, take them to church. On Thursday evening at 5 p.m., we will celebrate the coming of our Savior. Yes, we will do candles. I love that part of it, too. And and it's beautiful carols and scriptures, and we'll uh, have the Lord's table together. We'll celebrate why he really came, that his body would be broken so that we'd be made whole. That's at 5 p.m. on Thursday, this Thursday, December 24th. We will not meet here on the 23rd. Normally we meet here on a Wednesday evening, but uh, we will not be meeting here. I guess if you want to come, just pray around and and get it ready for us, but we'll be here Thursday evening. Then the following Sunday, we'll be together December 27th at our regular worship time. The following Thursday, which would be December 31st, we'll meet here at 7 p.m. and celebrate the Lord's goodness through 2020. You know, this has not been a bad year. I, I just want to pop that bubble, because you're still sitting here, and you're still hearing the gospel and understanding if not, you've even already received and you still have your Savior. This has been a great year. This has been a year of protection, provision, healing, deliverance. In fact, for some people, this has even been a year of overcoming, overcoming some fears, overcoming some doubts, getting over having to be alone. For some people, that was hard this year. And for others, we came to value and appreciate the coming together. So this has been an overcoming year. Yes, there have been difficulties, but we are more than conquerors. We already have the trophy. We don't have to wait for the Super Bowl. Your name is already on it, although maybe it'll say Packers this year. <laughs> but you already have the trophy. You are more than an overcomer. Celebrate this year. And when someone whispers that to you or even says it out loud, like someone did to me last night, they said, this has been a tough year. And I said, yeah, but I won. I won. It's okay if it's a tough year if you win. It's okay if it's a tough game and you win. Yeah, that's what matters. And so we're going to celebrate that next Thursday at 7 p.m. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Well, this morning we have a, a sad announcement. Pastor Kim had some joyous announcements, but we have a sad announcement to make this morning. But we believe God is, is undertaking making a way. Um, this is going to be Pastor Jim and Leah's last service with us today. Um, yes, they have made some changes uh, with their employment and their future and uh, this is going to be their last service with us and and um, though we're sad about that we accept we and we respect that decision now if you're going to be fishing for uh, beefs complaints um, you'll have to fish in a different pond because we I don't have any beefs and I know Pastor Jim doesn't have any beef, so you'll have to fish in a different pond on that. They've simply made uh, decisions for their employment, and we respect that. We accept that. It'll be a big change. You know, we, Pastor Kim and I, we prayed out on the, on the mountain, uh, Prayer Mountain, Phoenix, Arizona, two years ago, and asked God for help. And we believe God sent us help with Pastor Jim, with the Nelsons there. Um, but we're gonna be, there's going to be some changes here as of today, and, and we're, on, we're, we're sad about that. But we believe God has a bright future for them. God will lead and guide and direct. So uh, we want to pray for Pastor Jim and Leah, and we're going to ask if they'll stand 
Uh, and then everyone else will stand as well. And we want to pray for them. And uh, you make sure to greet them. You make sure to love on them. You make sure to tell them how much you've appreciated their time here with us. And again, I know that God has good plans. He has good plans for every one of us, and he has good plans for them. So, Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, I want to thank you uh, for bringing Pastor Jim here to this church, Leah to this church. Lord, you knew what we were crying out for. You knew what we were asking you on the side of that prayer mountain, Lord, in Phoenix, those couple of years ago. And you sent him here, Lord, and how thankful we are for that. And for the ministry that he's brought to us, Lord, the fellowship, the work, the joy, Lord God. And uh, Holy Spirit, we know that your, your future is absolutely known. Now, to us, we're often befuddled by that. We, uh, we often don't even know what's happening today, Lord, much less tomorrow or the years ahead, but you know. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray that you will establish Pastor Jim and Leah uh, in the church, in the ministry, in the calling that you have for him. Lord, we pray that that calling will increase and multiply and expand and become greater and greater. Lord, we, th we, we are believing you that the seed sown here uh, will go with and, and be a blessing in a future place, Lord God, that what was sown here will increase and multiply as well. And we just pray that you will lead and guide and direct them and cause your peace to rest upon their hearts. In times of transition, uh, we're often nervous, we're often afraid, we're often uh, just wondering what the heck is happening. But Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace, and we ask that you'll just come near and be their peace, be their guidance, be their direction, and bless them, Lord. And we speak the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and adds no sorrow. We speak the blessing of God that where they go and what they do will be blessed of you, Lord. That where they put their hand to, it'll be blessed of you. That when they rise up, it'll be blessed of you. When they lay down, it'll be blessed of you. That whatever they're called to do, that it would be blessed of you. And we speak the blessing of God. We release them, Holy Spirit, uh, into the work and the calling and the plan that you have for them. In the name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. And let's put our hands together just as a thank you for their time in ministry here. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and you may be seated. Well, we're going to bring our tithes and our offerings here this morning. And again, what a great privilege to, to be a giver, to be a tither, to be someone who, who just honors God with tithe and offering. And uh, we're going to go to the scripture verse here this morning, again, from uh, the Christmas account and the Christmas story, Matthew 2. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, we can speculate here that Jesus was no longer a baby because they say he's now a child that he's no longer in the manger, he is in their home. And uh, how old was Jesus at this point? Well, we really don't know. We can speculate at least a month old, probably a couple years old. Again, they've journeyed down to Egypt, they've lived in Egypt, they've journeyed back uh, to Israel. So we're going to speculate. I mean, they call him the child. So maybe, you know, two, three years old, who knows. Um, but these wise men, these magi journey, do they come from Saudi Arabia? Do they come from further east? Again, we don't know this, but they come, and the, the part that I want to emphasize to you this morning, they bowed down and worshipped him. Now, you know, it says treasures of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but let's just throw that away. Let, let's just say it was flour, corn, and wheat, you know, um, the, the real emphasis here isn't on the, the preciousness of their gifts per se. It was of their heart. What was in their heart? They bowed down and they worshipped him. They obviously had a revelation that this child wasn't just a child. I mean, for crying out loud, they journeyed for months, maybe years. We don't know. But they bowed down and they worshipped him. Do you know that your giving... Your giving is a worship unto God. It's an absolute worship unto God. And if you give 37 cents like some of these kids do, or if you give a pant load like some of you know, the adults that we do, it's a worship unto God. And you know, I can't tell you, and I've shared this with you before. <laughs> I can't tell you how often 
Pastor Kim and I weep over the giving in this church. I mean, it's just, we weep with amazement at total strangers. I mean, people, we don't have a clue who they are. And here's a check to our church. Like, how does that happen to, you know, you who have been with us for, for 30 and 40 and 50 years, and you just faithfully write those checks to the children and parents? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you for teaching your children how to give. Again, we love to see the $500 checks, the $2,000 checks, but I'll tell you, it is as thrilling to us when we see a six-year-old, when we see a nine-year-old with their dollar and 13 in there. I mean, it's just, and that, that lesson that you are teaching them, I promise you, parents, is going to be a great, great blessing in the future years. When your kids learn how to give, wow. And so God bless each one of you who truly Worship God in your giving. And never feel that that amount that you write or put in there, oh, that, that's nothing. It's, you know, it's $2 or it's, it's $82 or it's two, you know, whatever. Never feel bad about your giving. Never, ever feel bad about that. When your heart is given to God, it's a worship unto him. It's an absolute worship. And they bowed down and they worshiped him. Amen. So on your offering envelopes, we're receiving special love offerings for our staff and how thankful we are for that. And we want to give them a, a generous Christmas bonus uh, to help them at this time. So you can put down staff or Christmas staff on your envelope and we'll know how to designate that. Well, Mr. Nelson, if you'll come and pray and I like the hat and I like your kids and all the, hey, you've kind of got a rock and tie too. Did you, did you pay more than a, a dollar though? Oh, nothing. That's even better yet. So pray and, and bless these tithes and offerings. Father, thank you so much. You are so, so good to us. We love you. We adore you. We praise you today, and we bring you glory. We thank you for the privilege to give, yeah. Lord. You give so much to us in so many ways. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor to give back to you. Uh, and help us to do it with joyful hearts. We pray that you would multiply everything that's received today for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
in a moment everything changed on a silent night came the promised child in a stable so humble and poor unto us was born the savior of the world love came down hope was found a star lit the sky the angels cried glory Hope is alive, cause love came down, love came down, in a moment peace broke out, now the prince is here, there's no need to fear, in a manger, eternity rests. No one to us was born, the savior of the world. Love came down, hope was found, a star lit the sky. The angels cried, glory, light broke. Darkest night, hope is alive. Hope is alive. Cause love came down. Love came down. Love has come for you. Love has come for me. All the earth will sing Emmanuel. Love has come for you, love has come for me, and all the earth will sing Emmanuel. Love came down, hope was found, a star the sky the angels cry glory light broke through the darkest night hope is alive hope is alive cause love came down love came down I'll take that. I'll take that. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you very much, Marcy. We appreciate that. And thank you to each one of the musicians and the people who are working sound and light. You know, to do this play here and to have videos and all that, uh, none of that is easy. It takes work. But each of these people do such a marvelous job in their, in their service. And we're just very appreciative of that. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Oftentimes, it's only when there are when there's sound feedback or dead mics or whatever that people look at the sound people, but uh, they do a great job on a regular basis, and we're really thankful for that. Well, I have a couple more announcements here. Hey, don't rush out the door this morning because... Uh, we have a sweet treat for everyone here today. Now, normally it's just the children that we give the, the little fruit snacks. This little girl who came to our house, she says, do you have a treat for me? <laughs> I said, yes, we do. Yes, we do. And we gave her a little, a, a little treat or a little present. But uh, normally we just give it to the children. But oh, it's for everyone. So don't just rock it out the doors. Uh, come and greet us and we have a sweet treat for you. And then big news, big news, big news, big news. Hey, tomorrow, 
Now, today is Sunday the 20th. So that means tomorrow is Monday the 21st. Oh, isn't that revelatory? Well, what is Monday the 21st? Who can tell me what Monday the 21st is? It's the winter solstice where the earth tilts the furthest away on its axis from the sun. It'll be the shortest day of the year. 426, the sun will set. So the winter solstice is going to be the shortest day of the year. That is going to be tomorrow. But guess what Tuesday is? Tuesday is spring is just around the corner. Amen. <laughs> I'm an eternal optimist. I mean, I really, truly look forward to this day because in my mindset, now we've had a marvelous winter. I mean, we haven't had winter so far. You know, we just haven't had winter. But, uh, you know, by this time normal, we have, you know, a foot or more of snow and it's crazy cold and we're all carping and complaining. But I always look at that date of the 21st because that means the next day, Spring is just around the corner. So that's the way I'm thinking. I'm thinking of the flowers to plant and what to do with the lawn and things to do in the backyard and our deck. So amen, amen. Well, this morning, this morning, uh, I want to continue with the series of messages that I've began. You know, our, my first message was on the last uh, Sunday of November for those Spanish-speaking people, Noviembre. How did I do on that? Noviembre? <laughs> Uh, so uh, my first message was tis the season and how God chose the nobodies and the nothings to be the first people to see God in the flesh. These shepherds who were nobodies and nothings, they were the outcast, they were considered to be less than, than substandard, you know, but God chose those shepherds to be able to see the Savior for the first time. And then Christmas is promise, you know, pregnant with promise. Mary was pregnant with all the promises of the Old Testament. All the promises that those prophets had prophesied for hundreds, some even God in his declaration for thousands of years. And he will bruise your head. You will strike his heel, but he'll bruise, he'll crush your head. Mary was pregnant with promise. And then last week we looked at Christmas is problem. God, do you see? Do you hear? Do you care? You know, there's, there's a lot of problems in life, and Mary and Joseph had a problem, a major problem, a five-alarm fire. Mary was pregnant before she was officially married. They were engaged, but she was found to be pregnant, and that is a problem. That is a problem. But God has solutions in our problems. And I gave you those four points yesterday. And I just encourage you to get, you know, I've had people ask, well, are, are there CDs still made of that? Yeah, yeah. I encourage you to get that. That'll save you. It'll really save you in your problems because, again, I preach this just out of personal experience. But this morning, this morning I want to preach to you about Christmas is power and how we can have a transformed life. Christmas is promise. And we'll close out the Christmas messages next Sunday with Christmas's passion. How should we then live? But this morning, Christmas is power. Now, you know, for many people, Christmas is nothing more and nothing other than food, family, uh, Santa, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Buddy the Elf. You know, isn't that just a marvelous movie? You know, Elf, uh, Will Ferrell, we love to watch it every single year. And that's, you know, that's, that's all that Christmas is to, to most people. If you were to poll uh, many, many, many children, they would have no clue, zero clue, that Christmas has anything to do with the Savior named Jesus. They would have no clue about that. So for most people, it's just food and family and presents and all those other things. And it's all cloaked in sweet sentiments and, and cards given with all the pictures of their children. And we love the cards and we love all the pictures of children, don't we? I mean, we love getting Christmas cards and seeing. And you, and you look at that child and you go, my gosh, look how they've grown. They used to be a, ch a, a, a kid and now they seem to be a grown adult there. You know, we love the cards. We love the pictures. We love the sentiments. You know, we love reading, you know, what's inside the cards. Uh, th those things are wonderful. Um, 
but that's often that just all that Christmas is. And then, you know, right after Christmas, obviously, is, is New Year's, you know, the new year that rolls around. And, and we come to that with all kinds of regrets and promises to do better in the following year. And that usually lasts for about, you know, two or three weeks. <laughs> you know, and that's just the way the new year rolls around. And then, and then after the new year, the same old mundane routine of meaninglessness continues you know and uh, and there's often depression after the Christmas and New Year's you know there's all this anticipation there's expectancy and a lot of it is is hyped more than it should be but you know after Christmas and after the New Year then people tend to settle into their to their mundaneness you know of pain and sorrow and drudgery this is just you know my life or poor health and pessimism. You know, 2021 is going to be no different than, than 2020. There's struggles, there's oppositions, there's difficulties that just seem to be the standard and the norm for life. And I hate my job, I hate my family, uh, you know, I'm a mess, and by the way, my car battery is dead. I need a new battery, you know. Um, that's, that's kind of the way things are. But Jesus didn't come for us to live in that. Now, Jesus didn't come to make a perfect life for each of us. Because last I checked, life is hard. Life is difficult. So Jesus didn't come to just uh, be our Santa on our wish list. Um, how many of you had children by a show of hands? How many of you, now this, this is a little dating here because they don't do as much paper advertising anymore. But how many of you had children and they would get the Sears catalog or Walmart or Target and they would circle things on those papers or any? Yeah, amen. You know, and with some of our kids, there was circle after circle after circle after circle, you know, just, uh, you know. And so Jesus didn't come to, to be our Santa with our wish list. Jesus came to transform our lives. To free us from that drudgery, that mundaneness, that meaninglessness. I feel sad for people that don't have purpose in their life, who get up every morning, they wonder what the day is going to be about. I feel, I, I genuinely feel sad for that. I thank God that even long before I became a pastor, I had a calling on my life. I mean, when I got saved, I couldn't do enough for Jesus. And I wasn't a pastor, but there was a burning passion, a burning desire within me to just do something, to be something for God. I had seen powerful Christians, and I thought, man, I want to be like them. I want to be an impact maker. I want to be like that person. I want to imitate that person. I want my life to be changed and transformed. And by God's grace and power, it did. I mean, things just began to drop off of my life, and, and new things inputted in by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God and the promises of God. So Jesus didn't come to just be our Santa to be our, our wish list. Jesus came to transform our lives, to give us power. He said after his resurrection, you will receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So he gives promises to his people, the Jews. And, you know, Mrs. Paulzer and I were talking about this. You know, there's a branch in Christendom that believes that we as the church are Israel, that we have replaced Israel. I'm sorry, time out, no, that is not true. Israel is Israel, they are the root, they are, they are the, the, the stalk. We are simply the branches. We're just the branches that have been graciously grafted in. Graciously grafted in. And you know, there's coming a day, and we don't know how this is going to happen, but there is going to be a revolution of Jews to where they're going to turn to the Messiah. Their eyes are going to be open, and they're going to recognize the Messiah that's already come. Now, to the Jews, they have forever and always been a, a, a maligned people. Even when they were in right fellowship with God, they were a maligned people. And to this day, the Jews are a maligned people. I shared with you recently when we were in Tel Aviv for their, the equivalent of their 4th of July, their Independence Day, how this gal, with tears streaming down her face, said, I wish I wasn't a Jew because everyone hates us. You know, in the world. And there's coming a day where the entire 
world will turn against Israel, will advance, the Bible says advance, and they'll fill that valley of Megiddo. We stood on the top of, of, uh, of Mount, uh, Mount Carmel and looked down over that valley. And, I, and I, used to, I would read in the scriptures how there would be millions of people and, and, and forces and military, and I thought, how? How can, that's a really small nation. How, how can that be? And we stood on the top of Mount Carmel and we looked out over that valley. Oh, and, there's a, and there's an airstrip right there so that planes could come in and take off. And easily you could fill that valley with millions upon millions upon millions of soldiers. And there's coming a day where the world will turn against Israel and they're, gonna feel, they're just going to be licking their chops. Finally, we're going to exterminate these people. And the Bible says that God will come out of heaven and the word will come out of his mouth and he'll smite those nations. He will literally smite those nations. And so wherever Jews are, even today, they're maligned, they're hated, they're, they're looked down upon. Well, this has been the case for thousands of years. And so God tapped the heart of a prophet named Isaiah and he gave a prophecy to this people and here's what it says. Here's what it says. And let's see, Will, I'm going to have to pause here. I'll get this uh, booted up here. Well, you, you can spool it up onto the screen. There it is. Nevertheless, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. Again, the prophet speaking prophetically, not only to the people then of that day and of that age, but for the future as well. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, in the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future. And I want to say to each of you here, you know, whatever your past may be, that's your past. That's right. But God has a bright future for every single person. I, I don't care how bad, how many strikes are against you, how many skeletons rattle in your closet of your past. God has a future for you. And this is part of the power of Christmas, is laying hold of that future that God has. Pastor Paul's are always said, the future is bright with the promises of God. I believe that. I believe that. So in the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. And again, not only to the people then, but prophetically speaking, hundreds and now thousands of years into the future. And here's then what the scripture says. Let's see, we'll go back to that slide. I, I advance it too fast. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now, only those who have been really, truly saved can appreciate that verse. If you have really, truly been saved, you can recognize, oh, a light came to my darkness. Yeah. Prophet Jeremiah says darkness is over the, or, or over the people and gross darkness is over the earth. And you know, you don't have to be an axe murderer. You don't have to be a, uh, a meth dealer. You don't have to be an embezzler. You know, uh, you just have to know that you needed a savior. And again, I'll, I'll never, and I've shared it so many times, but I will never, ever, 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 ever forget the moment that God saved me in that bathroom in my parents' second floor as I'm holding the vanity so the room doesn't spin out of control in my drunkenness. And God says, I love you in spite of yourself. I knew that I was a sinner. I mean, my gosh, I knew that I was a sinner. And I needed a Savior, and I couldn't change my I was powerless to change my I literally couldn't I would try and I would try and I would try and I would fall and I would falter and I would fail and I would try and try and try and I would fall and I would falter and I would fail but when that power came into me the power of God through the person of Jesus Christ he rocked 
my world. And change began to take place. And so this prophet speaks. He says, you know, those of you who are in distress and in gloom, he says, there's going to be a future. And he says, here's what's going to happen. There's going to be a great light, a light dawning on those living in the shadow of deep darkness. And again, only those who have been truly saved can appreciate that verse on the screen. You know, is there anyone here? I don't need a show of hands. But is there anyone here who knows any gloom or distress or darkness? Or does everyone just whistle through life and say life is peachy keen? I whistle. I don't whistle in the morning anymore. <laughs> I was told early in our marriage, again, I'd get up early and, and I'd whistle in the bedroom and I found out pretty soon that was not acceptable in our bedroom. I don't whistle in our bedroom anymore. All right? But, you know, does everyone here just whistle through life and just, you know, skip through life? I, I, I don't think so. You know, how, 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 do, how, do, how do people get through life? How do you get through life? How do you get through life? Are you still trying to fix yourself? Are you still trying to solve your problems? Are you still trying to provide for yourself? Or get, how, how do you get through life? Do we just plug along and, and hope for the best? And maybe with that, is there any hope? You know, is there any hope? Is there any solution? Yes. Yes, there is. Again, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A great light on those living in the land of deep darkness. A light has dawned. You know, we don't have to live in gloom, in distress, or our shadowy past. Because there has been a Savior that has come to earth to rescue us, to reach into us. And not just simply to rescue us and reach into us in the here and now. But here's, here's the icing on the, on, on the cake. Here's the cherry on top of the icing. Here's the candle on top of the icing and the cherry that shines bright. Guess what? You can live forever in heaven. I mean, I think it would be enough. Well, it actually isn't because the scriptures say it's not enough to have hope just in this life. In fact, the scripture says if only in this life we were to have hope, we're to be people that are most pitied. If this is all we're thinking and we can just make this a utopia, it'll never be a utopia. But even if you could make it a, a utopia, it wouldn't compare to heaven. So even if we could fix our problems, fix ourselves, the greatest problem... I mean, Jesus says, you can live with me forever and ever and ever. And you know, if you have friends and families that you genuinely love, present that to them. If you really love your friends and family, you need to present to them the plan of God so that they too can live forever with God. Oh, and by the way, they can live with you too. Now, I know a lot of people get that mixed up. I can't wait to see grandma. I can't wait to see my spouse. I can't wait to see my kids. Well, that will be there, but your first priority should be, I can't wait to see the face of God. The psalmist says, when I awake, I will see your likeness. And if you love people, if you love friends and family, point them to Jesus. If you have genuine love for people, point them to Jesus so that they too can know the Savior and they too can go to heaven forever and ever. We don't have to live in a gloom or a distress or a shadowy past because there has been a great light shined on us who have been living in a land of deep distress. And that little baby born in a barn can change your whole world. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about this this morning. I've shared this with you before, that uh, we can trace our, our family lineage to about 1740, somewhere in there, back to Ireland, on my dad's side of the family, the, Ken the Kennedys and Fahys. We were Kennedy and Fahy. Anastasia Fahy married, I forget, 
Kennedy, you know, and not the Kennedys of Boston, you know, the president, <laughs> no. Because <laughs> uh, we came through Canada, those Kennedys came through, through Boston, all right? But we can trace our lineage back into the 1740s and 1750s. And as far back as we can trace that, uh, uh, pub owners, liquor distributors, alcoholics, we, we can accurately trace that in our lineage. And that was, the, that was the history for us. In fact, I have in my top drawer of my dresser a picture of a bar, a very famous bar that was down on Barstow Street uh, owned by uh, one of my, let's see, it would have been my dad's great-great-uncle um, down on Barstow Street. And that alcoholism, that history was coming right into our family. As I shared with you before, my parents were functioning alcoholics. Not blackout alcoholics, but functioning alcoholics. And us kids began drinking. I mean, I was going to the bars when I was 15 years old, for crying out loud. I had my first beer, full, well, several beers, when I was 12 years old. And I hate to say that. I hate to say that. Under one of the bridges in Chippewa Falls. I won't say the person who introduced that to me. But uh, he's, he's a judge now, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you know, I started drinking when I was 15. I could get into any one of the bars. And that was our lifestyle, all right? But you know what? Years before that, my mother got saved. And that line was drawn in the sand. And that was broken. And you say, well, Pastor, you just said you were drinking. Yeah. But when I came to Christ, that stopped. That stopped. And I want to say to any of you, there can be revolution in your family. My mom was the first one to get saved. And now there are dozens upon dozens upon dozens upon dozens of Christians on my mother's side of the family. Power. Why? Because of a little baby that was born in a barn. He can rock your world. Those family members that you've just given up hope for, those, those children, your parents, whatever, their world can be rocked by Jesus. We had a testimony recently of something that happened. Wow, and a family member saved. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. Never give up on praying for your family. Right. Never give up believing for them that Jesus can come into their lives and change and transform them. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And here's what Matthew records. He says, she will give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And this is the word given to Joseph about the child that's going to be born to his fiance. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You know, there is a universal problem in humanity. It's called sin. And that sin separates us from God. But Jesus says in this passage of scripture he will save us from our sins and he'll be with us let's see save from our sins and God with us that's a pretty good combination isn't it yeah. and again pity the people genuinely feel sorry for them and then let that sorrow drive you to prayer for people who have no clue to this who have to go through life in the misery of life and the struggles and the difficulties of life and they have no help and the greatest need they have, what are they going to do with their sins? What are they going to do with their sins? But in this one simple passage here, God says, I'll save you and I'll be with you. Talk about a dynamic duo, a great combination. Save from our sins and God being with us. I want to share a personal testimony. Brother John Davis, where is Brother John? He is our chief usher. Um, Brother John... I've asked him if he would share his testimony of what God has done in his life. We knew, we've known John and Linda for 40 years. Come on up here, Brother John. They used to live on the other side of our parking lot. There used to be houses there, you know, long before this, this got all built up there. And John and Linda with their two children, uh, Tim, or uh, Gina and Brent, John Brent, um, we've known them for 40 years. And I asked if John would just share a testimony of how he came to faith. Share that, Brother John. Well, I think I was no different than anybody else. Without the Lord, it was strictly me, myself, and I. Yep. And uh, I'm just trying to be happy. 
I figure if everybody do what I want them to do, I'd be happy. If I was in charge, it was my way or the highway. And finally, like everyone else, I got to the bottom. I tell the guys in jail, I used to tell them that I was so, I was so sunk so deep in the bottom, I had to reach up to touch bottom. Yeah. But just like Peter, when he was sinking, he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord Jesus was there all the time. And he reached down, picked me up, and pulled me out of that pit. And then uh, besides happy, I found out I went to a place of joy. And then through the joy, I came to a peace. And that peace transformed our marriage, transformed our home, transformed my outlook. It just uh, it made a big difference in <clears throat> just what happened. The same things could happen, but in, in the midst of the storm, I still had a peace. And it wasn't dependent on my way to do it, my way. I found out some people got better ideas than I do. Yeah. It was a revelation, but it came through. Yeah. And so that's, that's what I found out the biggest transformation was just you get that peace. That Lord, and if my plans don't work out, maybe the Lord has a better plan. That was it. Amen. Thank you, Brother John. Thank you. And again, having known John and Linda, they've shared, you know, some details of their, of their family and their history. And they always share about the difference that Jesus Christ made in their family and in their home. Amen. Jesus wants to come into our lives and absolutely change us from the inside out to have power to be able to live the life that God has called us to. So here's what Paul says to the church at Ephesus. Now again, this church at Ephesus was in a major metropolitan city um, in Europe. And the city was known for its, its sexual debauchery, just debauchery. And then the worship of their god, this, this multi-breasted female god that they have, essentially when they would come together for their worship service of you know, idolatry, it was, it was a sexual orgy. But out of that metropolitan, you know, huge city came a church of transformed people. So again, you can have family members, you can have friends that are so far gone, you can't even see how far gone they are. But there's hope in Jesus for them. And Paul writes to this church in Ephesus, modern day Turkey today, and he says there's hope, there's change. Here's what he says. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ without hope and without God in the world. And you, when you read this in context, he then goes on to say, but in Christ, here's who we are. Again, our world is living in a place without hope and without God. That's a tough place to be. That's a tough place. You know, when you have friends and family members who, who are just bound by drugs or alcohol or addictions or whatever, don't get mad at them. Don't get mad at them. Pray for them. Have, have, have pity for them. Have empathy. Have sympathy. Better empathy than symp symphony because empathy you'll do something about. But they're just trying to deal with life. They're just trying to figure out life. And this is how I do it, to try and numb myself or to get myself picked up. Yeah. This, is, this is what I have to do. And why? Because I'm without hope and I'm without God. Now again, I was there. My family was there. My, my, my generations were there. And this is where our world is at. But a little baby born in a barn can absolutely change all that. And you no longer have to be in a place where you are without hope and without God. You can know God. I've had people say, how, how can, you can know God. You can know God. And not only can you know God, God can talk to you and you can talk. You mean you hear, you hear God? Yes, I do. Right, right, right down in here. I've only heard him one time here. Only that one time. But I hear him in here all the time. Can you know God? Yes, you can. Can you experience God? Yes, you can. Can your life be changed? Yes, it can. Yes, it can. And we don't have to be without hope and without God. No, God with us. And he will save his people. Saving us and being with us. Our lives can be changed, transformed. We know this from the scriptures that we're all sinners, right? 
I mean, we stand an equal height at the foot of the cross. We're all sinners at the foot of the cross. No one is greater. No one is less. We're all sinners. We're all equal at the foot of the cross, all in need of a Savior. The end result of that sin? Well, it's death. It's separation from God. And this is why I say, if you love friends and family members, point them to Jesus. Point them to Jesus so that not only can they, you know, be with God, but they could be with you as, as a Christian. But the end result of our sin is death. But the good news is Jesus paid for our sins. You know, he came as a baby, but he grew up to be a man, and he laid down his life for the sins of humanity, to remedy us, to give us that power, that change, that transformation. And that when we call on God, when we cry out to God, in whatever way that is, God will save us. Yeah. And that's the beauty and the simplicity of the gospel. That is the gospel right there. We're all sinners. Sin separates us. Jesus pay for our, pays for our sins. And if we ask him, he'll forgive us of our sins. That right there is the plan of salvation. They call that the Roman road, if you will. And when we lay hold of that, our lives can be transformed. Our lives can be changed. And that's why we have hope for our friends. We have hope for our family members. We aren't going to give up on them. Again, there are some situations where it would be easy to give up on our friends and family, right? It just seems impossible. But nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. First Timothy says this, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is Paul speaking to this young pastor named Timothy. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst. <laughs> but for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners. Now, twice Paul says this. So we can confidently say, even if it was just one time, we can confidently say, who was the worst sinner that's ever lived? The Apostle Paul. I mean, Scripture is what Scripture is. And what Scripture says, then it is. And if Paul says he was the worst of sinners, guess what? He was the worst of sinners. There's never been a greater sinner. And here is the greatest sin of Paul. And I think when you get to heaven, you can talk to him about this. And I think he'll concur. What was his greatest sin? It was religious pride. He thought he was right. Right, as Pastor Paul has said many times, is highly overrated. You can be right about something and you can be absolutely dead wrong in that rightness. In that rightness. Be careful of being right. Because you could be dead wrong. All right? So Paul twice says, I'm the worst of sinners. Christ Jesus. All right. So I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. This is why your testimony is powerful. Because you can say, look what God did in my life. You don't have to be the worst sinner because that, that trophy has already been given out. That's, that's to Paul, all right? And again, you don't have to be a meth head. You don't have to break into Fort Knox and steal all the gold. You just have to know I'm a sinner. And your testimony of salvation is powerful. Absolutely powerful. Two people influenced my life. Tim Kramer first and my sister Michelle second. And my sister Michelle's testimony was this. Real simple. Here's what her testimony was. After she prayed with Pastor Paulzer to receive Christ at Carson Park. She comes back, her makeup is a mess. She looks like a raccoon. Just her makeup was all over the place. And her testimony was this. Hey, Tom, you better give your life to Christ or you're going to hell. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. But you know what? I saw the change in her. And a couple of weeks later, I got saved because I saw the change in her. I saw the change in my former drinking buddy, Tim. I saw the change in him. Your testimony is powerful. And you can tell what God has done in your life. You share that with your friends. You share that with your family. Share it with strangers. You know, Share that. The powerful testimony. And Paul says, I was the worst of sinners, but God showed mercy as an example. Hey, you too can be saved. Kevin, you can be saved. Suzanne, you can be saved. Pedro, you can be saved. 
Keith, you can be saved. Because of what God did in your life, these friends and family members, they too can be saved. All right, so I'm going to ask Carrie Jordan to come up here um, and share her testimony as well. I've often joked about this. I knew Carrie Jordan before she was Carrie Jordan. I knew her when she was Carrie Bellings and uh, dating Al Jordan, right. And so I've known Carrie for 40 years, she and her husband and those wonderful young men that she has. And uh, she's going to share her testimony as well this morning. Thank you, Carrie. Well, I was raised in a wonderful home, very religious home, went to a religious school all the way through 12th grade. And I was your goody-goody two-shoes, teacher's pet type kid. Um, but I think that a big reason that I was like that is because I was afraid I was going to go to hell if I wasn't good enough. Yep. I didn't Keeping understand that, you know, I didn't understand the way of salvation. So when I went to college, I met some Christians and wanted what they had but didn't want to be weird <laughs> like they were. <laughs> And, um, but by, uh, by my junior year, I had been involved in some Bible studies and started going to Campus Crusade and went home one night in October just realizing they still had something that I didn't have. And I can show you the house on Farwell Street, red brick house right across from Wilson Park, wow. where on the top bunk in, that, in my bedroom that night, I gave my life to the Lord. Praise and there God. was, you know, immediate, wonderful transformation. But obviously God wasn't finished with me yet. And getting married and having kids a few years later has a way of exposing the pride and self-righteousness and things like that, that I found out I wasn't the goody two-shoes that I thought that I was. <laughs> and um, 14 years into our marriage, God met me in an absolutely transformational way and the only way I can describe it is that he confronted me with his holiness and I saw then the wretch that I was and um, when I saw that I recognized how great his love was yeah. Yeah, for right. me and just totally fell in love with him like I never imagined that I could and, and I think of John Newton's song Amazing Grace where it says he saved a wretch like me, I always add that first I received the grace to know that I was a wretch. Because I didn't, you know, it took me a while to get that figured out. And then he gave he made the grace to, to save me. And um, he's still working on me today yep, and always right. transforming. Yeah, amen. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you very much for that. So, you know, again, God's plan for humanity is really a simple plan that we've been created by God for God, all right? That we've been loved by God. That everything that's wrong in us can be made right in God. And that if we'll reach out to him in humility and in honesty, our lives can be changed and again, oh, by the way, you can go to heaven. You can go to heaven. You know, the Apostle Paul, again, is, is the greatest example of this. You know, and he just says, I'm, I'm the worst sinner that's ever lived. But God's grace was extended to me so that in me, the worst of sinners, I can be saved. Anyone can be saved. And those of us who have been in Bethel Church remember the, the crazy, ridiculous, unbelievable account of Bob Larson. Now, if you didn't know Bob, Bob was the most miserable... Now, Paul was the worst sinner. But Bob was the most miserable person you ever met in life. Hands down. No competition. No competition in that. Bob Larson was the most unhappy, miserable man in life and through some things that happened in his life he he started coming to church and we marveled at it because he would just he would just well no one had ever seen him smile in his life no one had ever seen the man smile in his life the first time i met him he handed me a can of dr pepper said turned it over 
this can is outdated. It's old pop. Good to meet you, Bob. <laughs> the most miserable man that ever lived. And he'd come to church alone by himself. And on a Wednesday night, I had an altar call on a Wednesday. I don't, I don't, I've only given altar calls on Wednesday a couple of times in my life. But I felt the Holy Spirit say, give an altar call. We stopped the music. We were, we were singing. We were praising the Lord. We were worshiping the Lord. And uh, I said, honey, I will, if you need Jesus Christ, you need to give your life to Christ. I want to pray with you. And I stepped down. I want to pray with you. I believe there's someone here, you know, who needs to give their life to Christ. And no one came. No one came. But I, I knew I'd heard from the Holy Spirit, and no one came as I winged, you know, turned around, came up onto the platform, just kind of pondering in those few seconds. And we sang just a little bit more, and, um, and I came down and, and did the altar call. I, I believe there's someone here. And my wife mentioned, my wife mentioned, she says, go talk to Bob. Well, Bob was sitting next to the last row. And I came down to Bob, and I, and I knelt down next to his chair, and I said, Bob, do you want to give your life to Christ? He said, yes, I do. I said, what? I said, what? Yeah. I said, now, Bob, you know what this means? I said that you, you, you can't live your life anymore. Jesus wants to change your life from the inside. I'll make you a new person. Do you want to become a Christian? Yes, I do. So again, I'm, I'm kneeling next to his chair, and I said, well, Bob, let's pray. Repeat this prayer after me. And he did. In Jesus' name, amen. I opened my eyes, and I said, Bob, according to the word of God, you are now a Christian and a candidate to go to heaven. And I wish there was a camera here to put it on the screen, but I'll just do my best. And here's what happened to Bob. And he smiled. No one had ever seen Bob smile. Well, here's the kicker, and those of you who been with us a while have heard this story. So Bob is born again on Wednesday. He didn't come to church on Sunday, which was surprising. We, oh, Bob was always here on Sunday night. Wasn't here. Wasn't here on Wednesday. Huh. Well, Carl was a good friend to Bob. Carl ministered into Bob's life, sowed seeds into his life. He thought, I'd better go and check on Bob. No answer. No answer. Eventually, they called the police to do a wellness check. They open up Bob's home. Bob is dead. Bob is dead. And we found this out later. The coroner said that he died approximately 10 days previous. And the coroner said either on a Wednesday or a Thursday of the week previous. He got saved on the Wednesday. The coroner said by the condition of the body, it was either Wednesday or Thursday that he, got, that he died. And I believe today, Bob Larson is in heaven. <laughs> the most miserable man you've ever met in your life, I believe today is full of inexpressible joy in heaven. And that's the power of Christmas. That's the power of that little baby that our lives can be changed and transformed. Stand with me here this morning. And you don't have to be the most miserable person on the earth. So again, the worst sinner, the Apostle Paul. The most miserable person, Bob Larson. So th those trophies are given out. <laughs> but you need a Savior. You need a Savior. Bow your heads, close your eyes. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, if you've never been born again. You know, last week a couple of young people, Caleb and, and Ryan, gave their lives to Christ. I believe there's going to be great power for change in their lives. If you don't know Jesus, you've not had Jesus forgive you of your sins. I'm not asking to rededicate your life. I'm just saying you don't know Jesus. Are you here today and, and you need Jesus to forgive you of your sins? Is there anyone here today that needs Jesus to forgive them, to change their lives, to transform them? We're here to pray with you, to help you. Amen.
And that's one of the reasons why we come to church. Now, you can get saved at home. You can have a powerful experience at home. Yeah, you can. But there's a difference when you can pray with a pastor. Amen. That's one of the reasons why we come to church. Well, hey, as I said to them, I say to you all as well, we love you. We really do. We love each one of you. And we count it a great privilege to know you and to be your pastor and for you to be associated with us. This is a special place. It's a very special place, Bethel Church is. And uh, again, if we can help you in any way along your journey, we want to do that. We really do want to do that. Uh, darling, if you'll come and close in a word of prayer and then, uh, hey, come through the greeting line. We have a sweet treat for each one of you. Sadly, I can't have any of those things, but, uh, <laughs> but we want to just give you a little sweet treat as, as you head out the door there. And then we'll meet together uh, Thursday evening at, uh, at 5 o'clock. And we'll have a great service that night. This, Christmas is a very emotional time. <laughs> because again, I, I recognize in my life the darkness I was in. Yeah. And I, during the Christmas season, with all the hoopla that I have and all the excitement that I have for Christmas, underlying that is a, is a tenderness and, and a tearfulness because of just how good God has been to us. Yes. And, then to, and then to conduct the service on Christmas Eve, you, you can't possibly know how I have to do my best to keep my emotions in check because it's what it's all about that a Savior has come into the world to save us. So, amen. Well, darling, you're all lit up. You can get lit up without... <laughs> Amen. Pray, if you would, please. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that just like Carrie said, you tell us who we are. We're not who we think we are. Yeah. 
Yeah. We're not who we feel like. Yeah. You tell us who we are. Thank you, Lord. And that's actually the greatest freeing experience. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for doing that in my life and in the lives of other believers. Mm -hmm. Thank you that you're doing that still again today. Bless your people. Let your light shine on them. I pray that as the people leave this place, that literally their faces will shine be, with being in your presence. May it be, Lord. In Jesus' name, we receive and believe everything you have for us. Amen. 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 Amen.